Welcome into other people's shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. I am so excited. It is finally the month of March. Let the madness truly begin. For those of you who don't know, I am a huge basketball fan. I don't know where you've been, but I am truly excited about March. I'm praying every day, maybe even fasting every day, that my beloved Tar Heels will make the NCAA tournament. As of this moment, it is kind of teetering on maybe, maybe not. So if you would join me in that prayer vigil, totally kidding, of course. But help me welcome in our guest today. That's really why you came here. I know it is. She actually comes to us from a past guest. You might remember this guy, Rob Diaz. You might remember him amazing voice kind of through through the circles of time and translation this lady was actually introduced to me through believe it or not three different people not counting rob she is a burst of joy she is a powerful woman with a big heart she's an overcomer having walked through her own difficult life circumstances one of her passions is to walk with people through their own difficult moments. She's an entrepreneur. She's an artist. She's a mama of two and a happy wife for almost 18 years. A day in her shoes? Well, they would look like her learning to love her family well and raise her son and daughter to be amazing, powerful, kind-hearted humans that love Jesus. And oh yeah, did I mention something? She loves painting hope shoes help me welcome her in all the way from medford oregon charity charity how are you today i am well thank you i know quite the introduction right (laughs) right (laughs) so i gotta tell you this you don't know this because i haven't shared this with you yet and i purposely didn't in the green room because i wanted to kind of get your shock and awe response to this my godmother is always on the hunt scouring the internet like she's just she's one of those web browser people i don't know she's just always out looking for things you know you know these people i don't know maybe Uh so she sends me through Facebook Messenger this Mail Tribune article featuring you and your shoes and your creativeness. And she said, you need to get this lady on your show. I was like, well, that's cool because I always like people helping me find guests. Let me tell you, as a podcaster, it is truly, the struggle is real. Interesting. Or as the kids say, real, about finding people. And so I think immediately I messaged you on Instagram like, hey, I'd love to connect with you. No response. And I'm like, okay, (laughs) cool. She's not interested. Sorry for that. Totally fine. (laughs) No, it's fine. I mean, creepy people <laughs> get in your DMs all the time, right? I mean, I, I don't know. That's happened to me a time or two. I've gotten some weirdos, yeah. so I get it. So then fast forward, a customer of mine at my retail location that I lovingly go to each and every day, it feels like, her and I are talking because she knows Rob Diaz. And she says, you know, you need to get this lady on your show. And I was like, oh, who is she? And she pulls up her phone to that exact <laughs> Mail Tribune article I'm not kidding you. And she shows me. She goes, do you know this lady? And I'm like, yeah, I do. So I messaged her and she didn't ever respond. And she's like, oh, well, I know her. Let me talk to her. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. Like, I don't really know you. And I forgot your name. And I'm feeling terrible in this moment because I don't remember her name. Joella. That's it. Yeah. (laughs) That's, that's it. That, I knew you. I was going to say, you probably know it. I see a lot of people in my defense. Yes. I build all of that to say like three, four different people are telling me about you. That's crazy. How crazy. How crazy is that? Yeah. Like, just respond to that, please. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> that's really exciting. When I got your message in, on my Instagram, I was like, yeah, no, nope. but I didn't block you which is like not my normal. Normally I'm like, yeah, block. (laughs) So I didn't block you. So I didn't get blocked. Okay. (laughs) Self-conscious, self-esteem, all of that just setting aside. That's so funny. Oh my goodness. That's cool. Well, it is cool. It is cool because that's how small of a community we truly live in. Yeah. Is that these people are not only looking out for you, which I think is super awesome. They're looking out for me too. As I'm telling, you know, telling them about the show and telling them what I'm looking for and who I'm always on the hunt for. Yeah. And like I said, three different people, three different ways coming in. And yeah, it's just, that is really cool. To me, I think that's, that's almost like a divine meeting. And then when we finally do get to connect it, it is kind of cool. 
cool. Yeah, I was going to say it feels like a Jesus thing. But no, I, I just think that's so cool. Why why did people keep referring me to you? Here's why. Is you take shoes and you create masterpieces from them. Correct. Right? Am I getting yeah. that right? And I think that's why they thought we would naturally be, as my friend in Texas says, which I still don't understand, chewing the same dirt. Have you heard that expression? No. That's okay. Because I still am kind of trying to understand it. Basically, it means chewing, like chewing like a like a cow or gum, right? Chewing the same dirt. Hmm. Maybe it's like in Texas, the roping and the riding, you know, and you're cowboying it down the desert and you're chewing the same dirt. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I I don't know. Maybe. (laughs) But he he has explained it to me as saying you're like in the same area. You're in the same lane. You're in the same thought process. You're in the same. You're chewing the same dirt. That's interesting. But now if I ever get to Texas, I might yes. with him you might have dirt to. with him. Like on a like on an Instagram live where somebody's not blocking me, hopefully. Too soon. Sorry. So back to you. So we love to lead off this question. What style of shoe do you like to wear, Miss Shoe Designer? You? I really like Converse. They're just kind of a go-to. They've always been since my <laughs> teenager days. I'm kind of getting older and so my feet can't handle those as much. <laughs> So now I'm at the point with like anything with arch support that doesn't look like my grandma would wear it. Let's stay cute, but like comfortable. Oh no. (laughs) Kind of bad. (laughs) No, it's great. No, it's totally fine. So I have upwards of 80 pairs of shoes. Oh gosh. Yeah. I, I might have a problem. You might have a problem. I guess the first step is admitting you have problems, yes. right? That's that's step one, I think. I don't know. I don't that's know amazing. the ladder or the steps. A lot, yeah. Wow. There's like six back here I don't even wear. Wow. I'm pointing back to the studio. Yeah, I can, so those I who, can see that. Those who, who, who are like, what is he pointing at? I'll tell you. It's shoes I don't even wear. There's a pair of shoes, like I said, on the vans that I don't even wear. I've retired them. That's why they're in the kind of on the wall. That's and funny, funny story with those is when I started the show, I wanted to get a pair of vans because the, the logo I chose kind of looks like vans. Yeah, it does. But I call them the wish vans. It's not copyrighted, you know. Gotcha. So for copyright reasons, they're the wish version of vans, as, as I affectionately call them. I got them and I purposely bought bought used vans gotcha. because I wanted other people's shoes. Aha. Uh-huh. Is that corny? Tricky, I tricky. I get it. Tricky. That's cool. I like it. So I used to wear them on Wednesdays, every Wednesday when the show came out. And then I started realizing my feet hurt. And I was like, why do oh. my feet hurt? And I'm like, oh, it's it's the vans. Yeah. They're pretty flat. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it truly hurts sometimes walking in other people's shoes too. But I'm ping. Okay. That was a bad joke. That was, that was a bad joke. <laughs> I am excited about talking to you today because what you sent us in our kind of pre-show paperwork, if you will, really got my mind racing because I think it's it's still a topic no one wants to talk about that really people want to keep hidden in the shadow that they've struggled with, that they've battled with, that they've had any kind of thoughts like this. That, of course, is like depression, mm-hmm. anxiety. Mm-hmm. We hear about this self-care. We hear about Olympic athletes walking away from Olympic sports that they've waited their whole life to get to. And then they're on the big stage and they walk away because of anxiety, because they're battling with depression. They're battling with, you know, suicidal thoughts. Yeah. Has that ever been a shadow in your life? And if so, maybe, maybe share that with us. Um, yeah, it's definitely been a shadow in my life over the years. You know, as, as a kid, it was always there, you know, it was always the thoughts of the world would be better if you didn't exist. You know, my, my coming into the world was not your typical mommy and daddy and, you know, everybody's happy. It was, it was, trauma. It was not a good situation. And so that kind of rooted in my heart, you know, I dealt with a lot of rejection issues and a lot of insecurities and a lot of different things like that. And depression was definitely one of them. It was, you know, that feeling of worthlessness, that feeling of nobody really wants you. Like why, why not just end it? Why not just be done? You know, I kind of grew up battling those thoughts and battling that feeling and and knowing in my heart of hearts because I was raised in a Christian home there had to be something there had to be a reason there had to be a why for my existence this little silver thread from heaven that just kept me going <laughs> I remember you know crying myself to sleep just just why why am I here what am I doing you know so it definitely was something that I struggled with growing up and even into my, even into my adult years and even into my marriage, you know, having those moments. And then after I had kids, it kind of 
amplified in some ways sometimes you know I didn't I was so naive when I had kids I didn't know about postpartum you know depression and things like that I had no idea but I totally struggled with that stuff I I mean I was I was like what am I doing I'm I don't get sleep I'm pouring out and pouring out and pouring out and I'm not getting filled the back up and I'm just ah! and so that depression you know kind of loves those thoughts of I'm giving and I'm giving and I'm giving and I'm not getting anything back and I'm in depression goes oh we like that that's fun let's play with that let's throw that ball around and let's you know toss that hurricane and and make those things happen and so yeah I mean it's it was definitely a struggle I would say that it still tries to come it still tries to taunt me it's still you know I have those moments where I go down that bunny hole and then I go "Mm, no no that's not the truth the truth is I'm here for a reason the truth is you know and then I have to pull myself back up with the help of God to just pull myself back up and go, "Mm, no, I'm anchored in Christ. I'm anchored in God. I'm anchored in truth. I'm anchored in love. I am loved. I am valuable. I do have a reason for being here. And then the world is all right again. So where do you think that that root cause comes from? Of depression? I'm wondering about you and your depression, because I know for everyone, it starts so differently. So for you, where do you think all of that started from? I think my trigger, feeling like I'm not enough, fear, feeling like I'm I'm failing, feeling like I'm dropping the ball somewhere, you know, I'm, I'm not enough somewhere. And so I, I think that's probably the root is that not enough feeling, never felt enough never felt enough in my family, never felt enough as a, as a young child, never felt enough as an artist, never felt enough. You know, I got straight A grades in, in high school, junior high, high school, but it was never enough. You know, my, my dad, he was kind of a, a rigid kind of guy. It was kind of old fashioned a little bit when I would bring him my straight A report card expecting, wow, that's amazing. It was, oh, that's pretty good. And I'm like, pretty good like my brother and sister are not they're almost flunking and I'm a straight A student I'm like when is it going to be good enough when is it going to be amazing when are you going to celebrate me and so I think for me you know that feeling of of valuelessness that feeling of not enough that feeling of why am I here (laughs) you know I I just honestly just went through something like this week where I'm like ah the world exploded and I'm processing and I'm going I can't do all the things. I can't carry all the things. I'm, I'm, I'm not enough. I, I can't keep all the balls in the air and I'm dropping them somewhere. And I, I actually took today off um, of work because I was like, I need a mental health day. I'm not okay. I need to stop. I've got to breathe. And so I took today off and I, I was like, you know what? This isn't the truth. This isn't where I am. This isn't who I am. So let's unravel this. And so I, took the thoughts and I go, "Mm, okay, so there's a little bit of truth here. There's a little bit of truth there, but most of everything that's been swirling around my head and my heart has been lies of you're not enough. You're never going to be enough. You, You don't measure up. You know, they don't really like you. Maybe it would be better if, you know, you just quit trying, you know, maybe, maybe it would be, you know, all those things. And so, yeah, I mean, it's real. It's, it's a real battle. It's a real seeing it's a real shadow, but that doesn't mean that it's not conquerable. It doesn't mean that that's where you stay. That doesn't mean that that's the truth. The truth is that I have value. The truth is, you know, all of those things, but yeah, I definitely, I definitely think that trigger is that, that shame piece of maybe how I came into the world, knowing that I, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't a beautiful wanted baby girl, it was, it was harsh. It was hard. And even though I was in a loving home, you know, I was raised in a Christian home. They loved me. I still felt like I didn't belong. So, I I mean, my siblings all have brown hair. My mom and dad have brown hair. I have blonde curly hair. It didn't match. Everything about me didn't match. It was a, it was a glaring reflection all the time of all the things that I wasn't, all the things that I wasn't good at. I didn't blend in. I couldn't be enough. And so I think that is probably one of the roots um, for those feelings and those thoughts. I just know doing this show as long as I've been doing it, when we walk down roads from the past, it can get hard, especially because we're we're being mindful, especially if parents mm-hmm. and siblings are still alive. We're like, we don't want to talk next necessarily negative about them, but we also want to give reality of how right. we felt. And so I always think that that's important and I right. appreciate and value every time someone does that. So I just want to honor that and, and acknowledge that. But I'm wondering about this. Thank you. Did someone make you feel this way? 
did someone bring these feelings to you and, and just demonstrate them to you in any way? Maybe it was verbal, maybe it was nonverbal. Well, I think, I mean, I think the earliest thing that comes to mind that was a demonstration of not being enough, not being good enough. My dad that raised me, um, I call him my dad because he's the only dad I ever knew. He had adopted my sister when she was two. She was legally his. And then my brother was biologically his. I was 15 when he finally adopted me. And so all those years um, went by. Why am I not good enough? Why don't I measure up? Why, why don't you want me? You know, my biological dad didn't want me and you don't want me and I exist in this family, but what's my place? I think that was honestly the biggest pain that just you know, loomed over my shoulders. I mean, I remember crying and screaming, you know, at night and journaling like a mad person just because I wanted desperately to be wanted by a daddy. You know, I wanted to know that I had a daddy. I wanted to have that resolve of, of a daddy wanting me. And I didn't until I was 15. When I was 15 and he adopted me, I mean, literal chains fell off of my shoulders, literal chains fell off of my heart and my mind. And it was like, I'm finally wanted. I'm finally, I've like arrived at this place of worthiness to him that he would actually want to adopt me. And so, I mean, I think that that was the earliest memory of that feeling. I always wanted to please be the little girl that made everybody happy and made everybody smile, wanted to be the joy bubble in the room, you know, wanted to make sure that people were taken care of, make sure that, you know, it didn't matter if I was dying inside, I, everybody else had to be okay. And so that was my job. My job was to make sure everybody was okay. Having that type of a mindset, you know, you, you start to, you start to kind of kill the person that you are inside for the sake of other people's happiness. <laughs> and so I was always, you know, I was always afraid of that little person inside of me getting out and letting people see that the happy, bubbly, cheerful person on the outside was really kind of a dark little monster on the inside. And I'm like, you can't know that, you know? So I spent my life like making sure everybody was happy and like killing, killing the me inside going, no, you don't get it come out. No, you don't get it come out. And as a result of that it triggers depression like crazy because you can't be real. You can't, I, I mean, I certainly couldn't talk about it. I didn't have a safety net to go I'm depressed. I don't know what to do with myself or, you know, those feelings in junior high, I got into cutting for a little short stint and it was, I just wanted to feel something because I couldn't feel, you know, I was so numb because I had spent my whole life kind of killing that person inside the emotions. It was, you know, my family didn't do a good job at talking. We didn't have conversations. We didn't talk about hard things very well. We didn't share emotions. We didn't, you know, we just didn't. My, my dad definitely didn't know how to do that. And my mom was honest if we asked questions, but if we weren't asking questions, we didn't have feedback. And so it wasn't anything on them doing something wrong, but it was, they just didn't know. They didn't know that it was okay to talk to their kids like that. They didn't know that answers. They didn't, you know, I, I don't know that they knew that they had it in them to help us through those things. And so they just kind of, Jesus will help them, you know? <laughs> and I think that that's, I think that's a little bit in that generation of, of people. The new generation now is no kids have feelings and their, their thoughts and their voice does matter. And we want to have those hard conversations because I think my, generation of people didn't have that as a whole. Like, I mean, I think it was uncommon for my generation to actually have conversations that went deeper than how was school today? Oh, it was great. And so we didn't, we didn't talk, we didn't share, you know, those were, those were those, those hard points, those, those difficult areas of just not letting that person out and wanting to just please everybody and make sure that everybody was happy. Uh, no, I, I think you're absolutely a hundred percent correct because I know for me, at least, you know, my, my dad was a Marine he is a Marine through and through whether he's retired or not. It is in his DNA. It's everything about him in those moments. Like we don't talk about our feelings. We don't cry. We don't, you know, we don't do any of that stuff. You know, you want to cry, go to your room. Like, I don't want to see it. And so that emotion can't come out because like I 
teased. Like I have more feelings for my wife and I combined. Like I, I have all the feelings for both of us. Like she doesn't have to have any because I have them for the both of us. It's kind of a fun little thing we tease each other about. In all reality, like when you're kind of an emotional kid, you kind of get shoved to the side because people don't know how to deal with it. Right or wrong, I don't know. But it sounds like that's what you're saying when I hear that back. Oh, I was just going to say, I looked up to my brother so much as a kid because I think he was the closest thing that I had to a dad figure. I kind of became masculine, but not like in a weird way, but like I did take on that. Well, I'm going to be tough like him. He, he's a army national guard, <laughs> took on that tough persona. You know, well, we don't cry. We, you know, we pump iron. We, you know, we go do all these tough, rough things. And so now <laughs> as, as an adult woman that's going through healing and all the things I'm like, mm, what does it look like to be feminine? And like, what is it, you know, so I'm kind of opposite of you of going, yeah, I can let her out because she's safe and she doesn't have to hide behind that tough exterior. And, you know, I can have those conversations with my daughter. I am fully filled with wisdom from heaven to give to my daughter and teach her what it is to be a woman. You know, it, it's crazy. The journey is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's shoes are crazy different, right? That's yeah. also why I love the show so much because we get into different shoes and everyone has a shoe story in, in some respects or another. You mentioned bringing dad the report card, all A's, and you mentioned a phrase that, that really stuck with me. Where was the celebration? Where was, where was all of that? There was no fanfare. There were no fireworks. There were no like, hey, let's take you to Red Lobster to celebrate. I don't know. I was just thinking of a restaurant. Yeah. It's kind of fancy. feels like Red Lobster's yeah. that fancy restaurant, at least, at least in town here. Maybe Jacksonville Inn. I don't know. Someplace fancy, right? <laughs> but I'm wondering now, you know, as an adult, who celebrates you? Who gets excited for you right now? Um, my husband is absolutely supportive. I mean, he he's my anchor. <laughs> But he, he is, he's one of those kind of steadfast, solid, loyal, very even keel, but he, he is my biggest cheerleader. I mean, he just, he's like, oh, you want to do that? Okay. How do we make that happen? Like setting up for this podcast today. I'm like, you know, it'd be really amazing if you could maybe help me with this. And I came home and it was all already set up and he's got all the things and, you know, go ahead and do this, this, that, and da, 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 you know? So, I mean, he, in his own way, absolutely cheerleads me. I mean, I used to think that because he's so steadfast and loyal and not like me, where I tend to kind of ping and, you know, all this stuff that he wasn't on the same page as me, that he didn't want me to do crazy adventures that I want to do. And then God gave me a picture one time and um, it was a picture of a rock. My husband was the rock and I was tied to this rock and I was a kite just flying and flitting in the air. And I was like so high and I could see for miles. And then I dart down and those are like the lows when I go, uh, you know, and I dart back up and I'm like, yes, life is good again, you know? And so, and in that moment, when God showed me that picture, he was like, he's your anchor. He loves you and he is so steadfast and he's there when you need him and he anchors you to reality and to being present with the kids and being present in your home. And I can't go too far out because I, I am one of those people It's like, a, you know, a balloon when you let the air out and they just, <laughs> I can tend to be that person. God gave me my husband to anchor me and to cheerlead me. And he has never not let me do something I wanted to do. I mean, he has always championed me like, okay, you want to start a cake business? Let's do it. I mean, he absolutely celebrates me in his own way. And then my kids also, I mean, they just, they absolutely celebrate me. They're mommy, this or that. When I got my article in the Mail Tribune, they were so excited. My <laughs> my daughter was like, I want to advertise for you. Can you paint me shoes and make me a backpack? And I just going to take it to school and tell everybody about the shoes. And I am, I am celebrated. And my mom absolutely celebrates me. She's, she's an awesome cheerleader too. My dad did pass away two years ago. So he's, he's not um, around anymore. Toward the end, he did, he did start to celebrate me. He changed a lot as I became an adult and his heart changed just it softened a lot was able to encourage me was able to embrace me and um i was just <laughs> i was just too stubborn to to not force him to love me the way i wanted to be loved <laughs> So I just kept pushing like, no, dad, you're going to, you're going to hug me and you're not going to look away from me. You're going to hug me and you're going to actually hold me and not just like 
tap me on the back. Like, no, you're going to, you know, so I got kind of bossy with him, but I'm like, you know what? I know that he loves me and I know he just doesn't know how to show it. I'm going to teach him how. And so he did grow and he did learn how to embrace me and how to show me that he accepted me, you know, toward, towards the end of his life. Like he actually called me and he's like, I need you to pray for me. I need you to sing to me. I need, I need you to just be here for me. And I'm like, okay, absolutely dad. So, you know, I sang to him over the phone for a while and I I prayed with him and yeah, so I am celebrated and all of my friends, my community, I mean, not, not in a, um, not in a cocky way, but like everybody literally loves me. You know, and I don't say that in a bad way, but like, I don't have enemies. Like, I don't, I mean, unless I don't know about them, but they haven't come forward. Like, you know, I I am celebrated. But what a juxtaposition Yeah. from when you were growing up. I mean, have you sat back and truly thought about that from the sound of it? And maybe I'm projecting here. You struggled to find friends. You struggled to find that kind of network, that community that we all desire as, as creators, as whatever we are. Yeah, absolutely. I did not have friends. I did not have friends growing up. And now the juxtaposition of that, if I'm using that word correctly, which I guess I need to Google now. But the flip side of that, the flip side of the coin on that is now you have this amazing support system, but you have this like community now of people around you that are celebrating you, that are excited to be, that you're in their life, vice versa. Yeah. What I hear in that is it gives tremendous hope to somebody who may be walking in those shoes, Vans or non-Vans, Converse or non-Converse, Jordans or non-Jordans, that there really is light at the end of this proverbial tunnel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's always hope. <laughs> there's always hope. We got to look yeah. for it. Do you know what your name means? Have you ever Googled it? I have, actually. What, it, what does it mean? What have you found? Let me see what your research department found. I put research on it, too. Let's see what they found. It means love, and it means to be wholly loved. So not just like, oh, I love you, but like to be wholly loved. I'm going to help. Benevolent goodwill and love. I don't know about you. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. To carry that around with you, to know that, to be like, wow. You know I mean? People say, oh, it's just a name, whatever. You just got, you know, your parents just picked it. I don't believe that. I think your name was chosen for a reason. Absolutely. Yeah. It was chosen for a reason when it was given to them. There's a story behind everyone's name. That could be an episode. I don't know. We'll work on that. I actually have a story behind my name. Oh, do Do you? Yes, please. Absolutely. (laughs) Yes. So when my mom was pregnant with me, my name was supposed to be Amanda. Amanda means beloved or, you know, lovable, like to be lovable. She was reading her Bible one night and she just felt like God was like, no, you're going to name her Charity. And her name's not Amanda. And so she switched gears and named me Charity. So there was an absolute reason for For that name and not just to be lovable, but to be all of those things, to be actually like the essence of love, which is really cool. (laughs) Yeah. Neil means champion. Cool. I love names. Obsessed over name meanings, actually. I really love them. (laughs) Going back to dad again, I can't help Chris Tomlin lyric out of my head. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. But I got to be honest, even hearing your kind of story with your dad and hearing how it was tough growing up and tough feeling like you were loved by a father figure, because I think deep down, we all want that guy, girl, doesn't matter. We all want that fatherly figure love. Yeah. I hate that song. Truly. It comes on in church and I'm like ready to hit the exit. They sing it at my men's group. Like I'm like, oh, I'll go clean the bathrooms before I have to hear this song again. Oh. And a friend of mine recently said to me, he said, I know why you hate it. Jig is up. Like I know. I'm like, okay, enlighten me. He's like, because you didn't have a good, good dad. And so therefore you can't think of God being this good, good father because God was truly good. He would take this from you. He would give this to you. He would do this for you. Right. Do you ever feel like that in any way or am I way off base? Oh yeah. No, absolutely. I think that that was, that was definitely an area in my heart that God had to heal. He had to walk with me to, to really truly believe that God is a good father and, you know, heal my heart in those areas and walk with me through that. When we were saying goodbye to my dad, I actually sang that song to him in front of my brother and sister. And I was just, I was just singing over him and we were kind of saying it was okay for him to go home to Jesus. I started singing that song to him and it was definitely a different moment. Wasn't just singing it to God because I truly believe that God is a good father. And I really like, that is one of my, one of my things. I'm like, no, I know that God is good. I mean, I, I have been through enough 
things and trauma and, you know, health challenges and different things. And I'm like, no, if, if God wasn't good, I wouldn't be here. Like I would have died in the ICU six years ago. Like <laughs> I know that, but yeah, it was, it was definitely healing to sing that to my dad and for him to hear that you know, as he was passing, you know, you, you are a good dad. He didn't have it all together. He didn't do all of the right things, but that didn't make him any less of a good dad because he did the best he knew, you know, he, he, he did the best that he could with what he knew. And, you know, could he have grown more? Sure. We all can, you know, could he have reached out more? Absolutely. We all can. You know, we all can grow, but giving that grace in those moments, like even with my mom, it's like, mom, you're a good mom. You didn't get it all right, but you're an excellent mom. And I appreciate you. And I think we can, we can allow God to fill those places in our hearts where those wounds have happened. And then God goes, yeah, but I am, I am good. And I can fill up those spaces and I can heal your heart. And even though you have the memories of the pain, your heart can be completely healed and completely whole. And you can truly understand how good I am and see it everywhere you go of, of the goodness of God. And, you know, I think that that's just a, I think that's just something we have to walk through. You know, we have to be willing to look back at those hard moments and look back at those emotions and and feel it. I think one of the things that helped me heal from that dad complex was being able to take myself out of my adult brain and my adult mindset and my my rationalities that oh well he did the best he could you know those things that that we say as adults to kind of put a band-aid on the hurts the kid hurts actually go back as that little girl and go it hurt it wasn't okay it was okay for me to feel those things it was okay for me to feel those pains it was perfectly okay and acceptable for me to feel disappointment and being let down and all of those all of those emotions that built into not having a great dad you know in those moments as a little kid in wanting so badly to be wanted you know all of those things and going back in as a little girl and going God, you were there with me as a little girl, as you are today as a woman, but let's go there. Like as a little girl, I give myself permission to feel those things again, to feel those hurts again, to embrace those moments of of difficulty. Let that little girl go. You know, I I had a friend that was actually Joella. She was praying with me and she, she said, you know, you don't have to be the good girl anymore. You, you don't have to be the good little girl that makes everybody happy. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're right. I, I don't have to, I don't have to be that little girl anymore. And so God has been walking with me, walking, walking in the shoes of walking through those things of, of going back to those moments, giving myself permission. I think, I think as adults, we just kind of go, oh, it's, it's history. It's that, you know, it's past. It's the past. We'll just you know, leave the past where it lies and pick up from today and carry on. But if we don't heal those moments, if we don't go back to those moments and let God heal those things and embrace those feelings and give ourselves permission to actually process those feelings and those thoughts and those mindsets, you know, I don't believe that we ever truly heal and can ever truly move on until we allow God to, to heal those areas. Yeah. hundred percent. And I think that's one of my favorite questions to ask, you know, I don't know how old you are and I'm not asking <laughs> to be clear. So take your age now at 2022 Yeah. and let's go back to seventh grade. How old you are you then in seventh grade? Again, you don't have to tell us, uh-huh. but what would you say to that young lady as she's on her way to math class or, you know, language arts or, you know, maybe it was pottery. I don't know. Maybe it's PE in the hallway, right before the bell rings, you get a moment with her one-on-one. What do you say to her? Wow. That's, that's a good question. I don't think I've ever thought about that before. I would tell her that she is enough. I would tell her that she is enough and that she is wanted. And I would tell her to, (laughs) I would tell her to do all the things that she wants to do inside her heart and just do them afraid because I was so fearful as a young person ever. I mean, I did not do anything. I didn't want to do sports. I didn't want to, I was terrified of, there was a chance of me failing. I would not do it. And so I would tell her fail, 
fail away because that's where you grow and that's where you learn and that's where you become. And, you know, the failure isn't failing, it's just lessons learned. And then you grow some more and then you grow some more. And so, yeah, I would tell her, just do it afraid, you know, go kick that kickball and do it afraid. Go try out for the dance team and do it afraid. It's okay. Like it's okay to make a bumbling fool of yourself and try stuff, you know, live, like live your life. Let that person that, because I think, I think for me as, as a young person, the person that was on the outside was, was happy and bubbly, but very reserved. I mean, I did not, I was not then an outgoing person in my, in my actions and what I did. I, I made people happy but I did not make myself happy. So, you know, I, I stifled that. Any, any desires, any interests that I had, art and choir were not stifled. <laughs> Those were the only things that I let out that were like, no, I love art and choir. Like I love these two things and I will tell the world that I love these two things. Yeah, I would tell her you're enough. You know, you're enough and do it afraid. Just do it anyway. You know, just live your life and let yourself express who you are and experience things that you're afraid of. And I tell my daughter that all the time. I'm constantly telling her, you know, she she wants to do things. And I'm like, you want to do that? She goes, well, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, but what if I, you know, I'm like, do it anyway, do it anyway, like get out there and do it anyway. And like, she has a lot of anxiety and I get it. I didn't, I didn't know that I struggled with anxiety as, as a, as a person, as a young person, I used to actually make fun of people that had anxiety a little bit because (laughs) I'm like, Oh really anxiety. Okay. Uh Uh-huh. And panic attacks, like really like toughen up and put on your bootstraps. Like, let's go. Like, get over it, you know, was my, my personality. So I'd have people, I'm having an anxiety attack. I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. Like, move along. Let's go. You know, after I spent my little stint in the ICU, I realized like, oh my gosh, I, I get it. Like I, I understand what anxiety looks like. I understand what a panic attack looks like. And I understand that you actually don't have control over those things, (laughs) you know? And I'm like, okay. So then I look at my daughter and I go, she's not overreacting. She's not being a crazy person. She's actually truly, really experiencing a real mental health thing in this moment. And I can give her grace to go, just, it's okay for you to feel what you're feeling, but do it, do it afraid, do it anyway. You know, let's work through those things. Let's, let's move on and, and, you know, coach her in those moments of, yeah, I get it. I I feel you. I understand what you're going through and it's okay. Completely okay to feel all of those things. It's completely okay for you to choose to not do something because you're feeling so Twitter pated inside that you can't even think straight. But then the next time the opportunity comes around, do it anyway. You'll have felt all of this before. You'll have had time to process all of this before. And then the next time you can go, I'm going to try it this time. I'm going to, I'm going to step out this time. And so moment by moment, you know, doing it afraid, doing it anyway, you know, conquering those things. That's good stuff. I love that. I love, I love the fact that you're on the same wavelength as I am on a lot of those thoughts, because truly I have thought that myself, you know, even though I'm kind of an emotional basket case at times, when I do hear people taking personal days, mental health days, things like that, I always laugh at and kind of scoff at and make fun of, but it is a real thing. I mean, it is, it truly is becoming more and more of a, of a thing that we need to be more more aware of and more empathetic to for sure. But you mentioning that little girl, that seventh grader telling her that she would be enough and that she is enough. Would that seventh grade girl recognize you now? I think, I think she would recognize me because I am fully alive now and I'm doing the things afraid and I'm (laughs) willing to fail and I'm willing to try things. So I think she would recognize that desire, you know, kind of like that kindred spirit thing of like, I know, you know, like we know what we know kind of a thing. (laughs) And I think she would probably be a little horrified that I would let her out. look at me now and go, you have lost it. You have like, you're completely out of control. But I think she would yearn to be that way also. And I think it would inspire her to let go and to maybe take those steps to letting that person out. I've always been an adventurer. I've always been that person. I just 
I never let her out until honestly, probably until after I got sick, really like fully, fully. Um, I got sick about six years ago and it was like a second chance. And I'm like, God, I'm, I'm not going to waste my life. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to stay in this fear zone and step out and fail. Like, no, I'm going to just step out because you gave me a second chance at life and I have to live it. I have to, I have to fully embrace it. I have to do it. I, I think, I think that that's a big, a big one is finally yeah i think she would she would love that that person is out but also go <gasps> you let her out <laughs> i do have to ask this what does this mean to you do more of what makes you happy that's my sign right there <laughs> i have a sign on my wall just in case do more of what makes you happy i think i think it's just if it's a desire in your heart and it's something you're curious about then follow that trail and you never know what's going to happen like you never know i was always i mean just an example i was always a color pencil artist because that was tidy and it was neat and it was put together and then one day i had a, went you know i've always wanted to paint and i've always been terrified of a paintbrush because the bristles are wiggly and the paint is gooey and it's just messy and it could get everywhere. And then I picked up a paintbrush and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so fulfilling. Like freedom, you know, this freedom and the wiggly bristles and the gooey paint. And, you know, I'm like, I actually love this. And so doing more of what makes you happy. I think saying yes to those desires in your heart that go, hey, what about that? You know, what have you ever maybe let's do that. Let's try this, you know, and finding maybe you're really, really bad at those things, but at least you tried, you know, at least you, you did it, you know, and then you can be proud of yourself for stepping out and doing it. And then finding those things, I think also staying in your lane, you know, doing the things that make you happy. It, it just keeps you focused. It keeps you living life with a purpose and not getting distracted by all the things, but just doing the things that I kind of have a mantra of like follow the peace. You know, if there's peace on it, then then follow that and, and do those things. But staying in your lane on, you know, doing the things that make you happy, doing the things that bring you up, saying no to the things that don't bring you up, that don't, you know, cause joy in your life. I think that's really important. I think, I think we get obligatory, you know, in so many areas, we just, well, I have to do this. Well, I have to do that. Well, do you really, do you really have to do those things? Or do you just think that that's socially acceptable and you're supposed to do those things, but really who you are, you don't have to do those things and you don't have to fulfill the social norms and the expectations. You get to look inside yourself and go, God, you made me a certain way. And I say yes to those things and the things that aren't mine to carry, like they get a big fat no. And then let's do this. <laughs> yeah, I think it's important to remember. I know there have been so many people, especially during COVID, who have looked at their life, looked at themselves in the mirror and say, is this truly who I want to be? And is this truly my life? And to your point, have have stepped out of that shadow of failure that has, that has gripped them, that has captured them, that has locked them in a cage. And they've been mm -hmm. so afraid to step out. And I think what you're doing is giving encouragement to that. Yeah. Now, does that mean somebody goes and quits their, you know, multi-million dollar job tomorrow? Maybe <laughs> if it's not making them happy, right? Uh, in some respect. Yes, maybe. <laughs> you're like, I don't want to take responsibility yeah. for that. I think it, you know, I think it's, I think it's a step by step. You know, I think, I think you look at it and you evaluate it and you go, I, what can, what is one thing that I can change today that starts getting me into the lane that I'm supposed to be in? It's not a cold turkey thing. I, I have the tendency of being that person, you know, of, I just want to quit and I just want it to change. And then I'm frustrated and I get depressed and I have anxiety and I have all the things because I just, I want to jump. I just want to go. I just want to do it. I want it to be now today, you know, but I'm learning to pace myself and I'm learning to walk that out and go, what's one thing today that I can do that will benefit my tomorrow. Then tomorrow, what can I do that will benefit, you know, and just kind of following that trail. And eventually, yeah, heck yeah. Leave your multimillion dollar job because you will have built your own thing and you will be working for yourself and you will be happy. <laughs> But it does take time. You, know, you have to pace yourself. You can't just rip off the bandaid and say, I'm healed. Yeah. And there's blood gushing out, there right? Is. Yeah. To your, as grass as weird as that sounds, right? Yeah. How can people find out more about you and your work and everything that you're doing? What What's a great way and in in an ability if people are curious about 
this artwork that we're talking about, kind of the underlining theme of what we're talking about today? Um, yeah, I have a website. It's www.hopewords.net. I'm also on Facebook, Hope Shoes on Facebook, and then Hope Shoes on Instagram and Hope Words 2021 on TikTok. So you can contact me in all those places <laughs> and then email Hope Shoes by Charity at gmail.com. Well, awesome. So you mentioned kids. I'm guessing just just because I'm a parent too, you have played a few games in your in your mom existence, right? Yes. Okay. You ready to play a game? Sure. <laughs> Are you nervous? I am okay. nervous. I'm not very good at games. That's all right. You're going to be really good at this game. So it's a game called Senseless, and I know you don't care anything about North Carolina, which is really sad to me because people need to care. It's a real thing. Like, yeah. It's very sad right now. Considered about moving right there, now. so I care a little. I mean. Move to Chapel Hill. It's a great area, I've heard. Yeah. Maybe a little biased. I can even send you a flag early if you want. Yeah. I know it's weird to have a North Carolina flag in the state of Oregon. That's why it's in my room, not outside. Yeah. Because it'd be really it's weird a if it's outside my house, right? It's a traitor. Yeah. I live in the wrong state. That's what everyone yeah. tells me. Anyway, we play this game called Senseless, so I'm going to roll. Are you okay if I okay. roll on your behalf? Yes. All right, here we go. Do you have a favorite number? I know that's weird to me. Yeah. I do. What is it? 27. That's a weird number for 27. Okay. We well, got number one. Which I know looks weird because it's a North Carolina logo, okay. but trust me, it's a number one. Okay. See, it has a two. Okay. And a three and other numbers. So anyway, number one is this. Weirdly enough, I did not. You saw. I rolled. I picked up the number. There was no cheating involved here. But here's the question for Senseless. Again, this silly game we play at the end of our show, and that's this. How do you want others to see you? I feel like we've kind of already been talking about that, but maybe, maybe we can now solidify it. How do you want others to see you? I want others to see me as approachable and real and honest and joyful, peaceful. Yeah, I, I, I just want to be seen as a whole unit and not like, you know, the celebrity where I've got it all together. I don't, I don't have it all together and I'm willing to go there. But what I do have is really real and it's really solid. I can give that to other people. And so, you know, part of my passion is, is wanting to walk people through difficult things because I know what's at the other end. You have to be real and you have to be vulnerable. You have to be approachable for people to believe that maybe you have been through something. Maybe you have something to offer. Maybe you have something to say about a question. So guys and gals, kids and campers alike, I get sad at the end of the show because I feel like we are saying goodbye to a new friend. Truly a new friend. So I don't know about anybody else. I want you to just think about this week as, as we process through what, what we just heard and what we just experienced. Process this through with me for a moment. What's that one thing, that nagging thing, that thing that maybe keeps you up at night and wakes you up in the morning, that one thing nobody knows about? What is it? Think about that for a moment. What is that? You got it? That one thing. What is it? Is that one thing stopping you? Is that one thing continuing to fail? Is that one thing continuing to just nag and bite at you? But you don't want to step out of the shadow because you're afraid of the word failure. You're afraid of the word anxiety. You're afraid of the word, in fact, even stepping out of it gives you anxiety, almost gives you a panic attack, almost has you have to call your boss for a personal day, a mental health day, because you can't escape this thought that keeps coming into your head. What is it? I don't know what yours is. But I'm going to ask you this. Just take a step. Take a step out this week. Do one small thing towards that thing, whatever it is. Whatever it is. Just take that one small step. My namesake, by the way, we were talking about names in the episode, Neil Armstrong. He once said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. What is that one small step you can take this week? Let me know what it is. If you if you take that step, even if it's a baby step, as Dave Ramsey says, we all need a baby step every now and then. Maybe it's a baby step. Let me know what it is. OPSpodcast.com is a great place to let me know. You can leave a voicemail there. You can also leave a little message in our comment box. You can even hit us up on Instagram, but let us know. I would, I would honestly love to hear what you think on that. What's that one small thing that has been failing you and keeping you awake at night and waking you up in the morning. What is it? Let me know. Again, I'd love to hear. And don't forget this. Do not ever forget as we let you go today. Do not ever forget. Remember when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.